my parents, my father primarily, got me and my sister interested in music through piano early at a very early age. We always had um, records uh, to listen to when we were children. This is in the Philippines. We had a little turntable, and back then it was 78 RPM stuff, and um, you know, children's stuff, classical stuff, and um, you know, nursery rhymes and uh, a few s popular songs of the day. But then um, when we moved to California, um, it, that continued, you know. But I mean, we both loved it anyway, and um, so it was fun. We, we sang, and my, my dad actually recorded us when we were kids, and I still have uh, copies of those uh, reel to reel tapes. And actually, he even made acetates of us singing, you know, nursery rhyme stuff, Baba ba, Black Sheep, and, um, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and nursery rhyme stuff, Old MacDonald, you know. So my dad really, in an unprofessional way, more like in a fatherly way, was into this recording, you know, of us singing, you know, for posterity, you know. And it's interesting that, you know, I ended up doing that myself, you know. Uh, and I, when look, looking back on it, it's really not that surprising because I had that really early, early um, exposure to it through my dad, you know. So the fact that I record things and I sing and I play in musical instruments really isn't that big of a surprise, though. I have to remember that to remember to realize where I came from, you know. So that was my earliest uh, musical uh, exposure. Oh, and we had all the LPs of uh, My Fair Lady and South Pacific and um, like those, which I really enjoyed and uh, listened to a lot. And you know, that's an education in itself. If you listen to it enough times, you know, you as a kid you absorb that, I think. Um, I, I already uh, had an aptitude for music, you know, I realize that now. I, you know, not everyone does, and I just happen to. And so it, it gave me a head start, I would say, on other kids that might not have been listening to music at that level, you know, musicals and stuff like that, with real songs written by professional writers, you know, with real arrangements and, you know. But I also enjoyed listening to the radio and I bought 45s and uh, at an early age I, and I, you know, had a collection. I still have it, as a matter of fact. You know, those albums, or maybe you don't know, but they used to have like photo albums, but you'd put 45s in them, you know, and um, I still have mine, like three or four of them, just full of great 45s, you know, and um, so, and I played violin at the age of seven. I wanted to learn. I don't know why all of a sudden I took an interest in violin, but I learned, and then we would go to Hawaii a couple of times uh, over the years, you know, summer vacation, the family would go there, and I learned how to play ukulele uh, from this woman uh, who, she taught hula and ukulele at the Hawaiian village, the Hilton Hawaiian village, which uh, was the basis for my understanding of the guitar. You know, ukulele four strings, guitar six strings, and so then, um, of course, I got lucky with my friends Dino and Desi. We put a trio together and we had some success. And like I said, I already had a musical interest and in, uh, in playing and, and this and that. And then just that time of the world in the United States and England with the music scene just exploding. And, you know, the Beach Boys were at the top of the heap in you know the early first three years 61 two, three, I believe were, were really their years of dominating until the Beatles came along and then it was like this tug of war you know but all I knew is that I wanted to get in on it and my friend Dino he wanted to get in on it in some way too we wanted to have a band you know and we just started out the two of us on acoustic guitars learning like stuff simple stuff because we only knew a few chords you know so, you know, we would try to learn songs by, you know, duets like Chad and Jeremy, Peter and Gordon, 
you know, that we could sing and perform together on acoustic guitars, you know, because really before that era, it was really pretty much folk music when you think about it. I mean, there was a little rock and roll, yeah, but um, when it, for, for a group scenario, there was, you know, it was like Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the Kingston Trio, and folk, and I, and I dug that, and I appreciate it, and I learned from, from, from those bands and groups as well, you know. Those are real basic chords that they play, and you know, I, I, they, that really helped me uh, in my understanding of guitar. We realized, you know, we probably should be three. We probably could use a drummer, you know, to make this thing at least a trio, you know. So Desi Arnaz Jr. was also a classmate of ours, uh, and um, he was like the obvious choice. So we asked him, and he accepted, and then um, we realized, well, geez, drummer, drummer is drowning, drowning us out. We need electric guitars <laughs> and amps. So we got some real crummy amps and crummy guitars, and we played through one amp, both of us on six string, you know, god awful sounding thing, but we thought it was the greatest. And then Dino decided, maybe I should play bass, aha. And great idea, you know. So now we're actually a trio that made sense, you know, with uh, bass, guitar, and drums, you know. Wow, okay, we're ready to go, you know. So we'd play parties around town, and, you know, we rehearsed a lot. And um, actually, we got to give credit to Jeannie Martin, Dino's mother, for making the call to Frank Sinatra to say, you know, you got to come over and hear the kids play. You know, okay, Jeannie, okay, whatever you say. So he comes over, and he and Dean Martin are at the bar, and we set up our stuff, or it was already set up, and we go play these, you know, three, four songs that we knew, which I'm sure was just excruciating for the two of them to listen to, you know what I'm saying? Coming from where they came from, musically speaking, you know, two of the greatest voices ever, with, who sang the, like the most, the most incredible songs written ever, you know? Having to listen to us, it cracks me up now, you know. But we were real serious about it, you know. And from that, we got a record deal. He, Sinatra came over, how'd you boys like a contract with my label? Yes, Mr. Sinatra, thank you, you know. But you asked me what was it like to hear the song on the radio. Well, it was a thrill because it was a great song that was given to us. Actually, the first song that we ever recorded didn't go anywhere didn't go anywhere. We even did the Hollywood Palace television show hosted by Tony Martin, still in black and white. This is 1964 on television, still black and white. And um, so we got a, a, a different producer, Lee Hazelwood, and um, Jimmy Bowen was our first producer. And Jimmy has done everybody in the business. He's discovered all kinds of people um, along the way country people, Garth Brooks, and uh, oh gosh, so many I can't even remember them all. But he, he oversaw the second project, the second single, uh, which is I'm a Fool, which is our first and biggest hit, really, and Lee Hazelwood produced. And, you know, much to our surprise, we weren't invited to the recording session of our record. And it's like, what do you mean we're not? Invi what do you mean we're not playing on it, you know? And it's like, well, this is the way we do it. It's like, well, you know, aren't we good enough to play on our, I mean, we're a band. Oh, no, 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 we, we, we're, we got it covered, you know? Well, yeah, they got it covered, you know, with every top session guy in town, you know, playing uh, on, on that date and on the rest of the album. We had four albums that followed, you know, but we didn't know about that use of studio musicians on records, we had no idea. How could we? We were 13, you know? We didn't know anything about much of anything, you know? So it was great. And we went on to do Ed Sullivan because our song was a hit. And uh, we had a couple of hits, actually. Six that charted on the Billboard Top 100. And it was a blast. It was a blast. And the, you know who latched on to us big time was the Beach Boys. They loved us. And we opened for them at the Hollywood Bowl. And they, took us on the road, and, and it was great. That was the best era by far of my life, the 60s, the mid-60s, yeah. 
you know, one thing led to another, and Carl Wilson married my sister Annie, and they asked me to join the Beach Boys, and, you know, the, well, I've taken you through pretty much the whole, uh, the whole spectrum here, and now I'm still in music. I work uh, with Al Jardine uh, on occasion. We do shows, a Beach Boy set list kind of show, and I also work with um, my friend Ricky Martin, who's Dean Martin's youngest son, and we do a tribute to his father, Dean Martin. And we all put on tuxedos, and Ricky goes out, and I'm the musical director for that, and he sings his father's songs and tells jokes and talks to the audience and shows rare DVD photos, uh, images of his family, and Dean with other well-known people of the day, you know, Lucille Ball and John Wayne and from his roasts and his TV show. and. Um, once a year I go to England uh, to do a, a Beach Boy fan oriented type show, smaller shows. I, I like to call them almost private shows for the fans over there. I usually go with Jeff Fosquet. This year I'm going with David, Marks, and Jeff. Um, and that's great fun. Uh, and I teach. I teach music here in Las Vegas where I live. I teach privately. I like to say to kids from 6 to 60 because that's the range of people that I teach guitar and piano to. Um, so I'm very much in music, but I still always gravitate back to video and film. Once again, my father and my mother, in this case, when we were young, living in the Philippines in Manila, my dad would buy the equipment, but my mom would be the camera person, you know. So we have great home movies of the Hinchy family, birthday parties and this and that, and uh, color, you know, uh, 35 millimeter? Yeah. Um, they made 35 millimeter, right? Home Maybe for 16. home use? 16. That's it. 16 millimeter, right. I'm a little rusty on my millimeters. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and so, once again, gee, it's no wonder I went to film and television school at UCLA because I grew up in an atmosphere where there, we'd show home movies and set up a screen and it was a big deal and it was a lot of fun. And so um, I still do that, you know, when I can find the time. Um, most recently, I transferred all this great footage that I shot in 1974 of the Beach Boys on tour, which I, I incorporated one of my classes at UCLA called Porta Pack into going on the road and doing a documentary. That's how I sold it to my professor. You know, hey, if you let me go on the road and work, I can do my uh, required uh, project for you. Oh, okay. You know, so this is 30 years ago now. So I recently transferred it to DigiBeta and VHS, and it's all preserved. The images are stable, as we say in the biz, and the audio is still good. And um, it is really something. Uh, there's probably about two hours of raw footage, of which maybe 30 or 40 minutes are usable. And, and what a thrill to see that after all these years. I didn't know what I had, whether it was any good. Uh, it's like, you know, you spend all this money on a great bottle of wine and you're not sure whether it's vinegar or not when you actually open it and taste it. But this was preserved. It's just candid, day-to-day, on-the-road stuff. 1974 was an important year in the Beach Boys history, I think, because it was a turning point in their career. Uh, they had just released the live LP which had gone gold and the double endless summer LP which certified platinum and was a huge success and this was right at the cusp of the Beach Boys exploding back onto the scene and uh, going out on the road with Chicago for what we like to call the Beachago tours where both groups played together so this was a very uh, important year in the Beach Boys history. You know, it's been 30 years and I've, you know, had it in the can, so to speak, all that time and now it's, it's uh, ready to be seen. I, the very first thing that I decided to do was to cut this film on Dennis 
for Dennis and used the soundtrack of a song that I wrote of the same title, One in a Million, for Dennis and his family, but really for me, you know, to do it for myself and, and to share it with the immediate family, but also with uh, Dennis's fans and his friends, and which I did at the most uh, recent Dennis Wilson uh, bash in Santa Monica at Shea Jay's. For my friend Dennis, you know, uh, it's taken a long time. You know, he's been gone 20 years, but now is the time that it, it needs to be seen. It's been 20 years, you know, and 30 years since I shot the film. It's, in, it's incredible, isn't it, you know? It's like, it's like, uh, I, I know why now I shot that stuff, kind of a thing. It wasn't really for a, f a film school project, ultimately. You know, Carl and Dennis are gone now. I mean, I still have them on this film. I never thought that they'd be gone now. You know what I mean? So it's like really special and powerful that I had that, I had that, that I did that without really knowing why. You know, the, 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 the really important reason why, you know, so. Malcolm Leo called me in 84, I think, because he heard that I'd done a, a project on the Beach Boys. This is a separate project that I did uh, at UCLA called uh, Project One. It was, a, it was the, pro, the, uh, the, the assignment was to go out and shoot an eight millimeter film and then sync it up to a soundtrack that were run on two independent systems. It wasn't sound on film. It was <laughs> film, sound, match them up, you know. And so, the, once again, I incorporated one of my classes into my work with the Beach Boys and my association with them. And so, uh, I've licensed footage to Malcolm and then, um, uh, Alan Boyd and Stephanie Bennett at Delilah Productions called me 10 years after, actually it was 98, 99, right after Carl died, to, you know, license footage for me for their project, Endless Harmony, and Peter Jones Productions, Morgan Neville, contacted me shortly thereafter, like right on the heels of that, to license film of uh, this, you know, whatever else I had for Brian Wilson's documentary uh, bio on A and E, and um, that is really the extent of it. See, music has been my primary thing, but it's like you know, I, I have to keep reminding myself, you know, you you have all this other st stuff and video and film and photos and you know, you gotta do keep doing that too, you know, but it's a function of time really for me, you know. When can I have the time to devote to that? Because you know how intense it is once you get into that. I'm in the process of writing this um, one that I'm going to be calling I Got Around. Um, actually, Mike Love gave me that title. Isn't that a great title? And so he says, you ought to write a book about your experiences in the 60s. And I call it I Got Around, you know what I mean? You know, that is a great title. I don't think I could get a better title than that. So I've written three complete chapters. Um, and one of these days, uh, I'm going to finish it off. I, I've realized that because of time, I've got to break it up into volumes. So it's going to be volume one, volume two, volume three, because I, I cannot devote just all my time to, to writing. I can't do it, you know. And I realized because it's been years and years now that, I mean, I started writing this in, uh, well, 95, 96. That sort of was a turning point year for me where I got interested and in, started diversifying from just being a musician. And um, so, uh, you know, I just have to, to bring it on home, you know, one of these days and just release these three, four chapters that I have done because it's like always in the back of my mind and it bothers me because I don't like projects that are incomplete. I'm, I'm really into completion and bringing it to a conclusion, you know. It, it, it bothers me to have projects left undone, you know. So the story goes, my father used to always ask Brian 
when are you going to write a song for Dino, Desi, and Billy? Because we were, you know, we had songs on the radio at the same time as the Beach Boys. And, you know, Brian had come over for dinner with Marilyn and, you know, my dad was always in there, you know, Brian, when are you going to write a song for them, you know? Okay, okay, Pop, because everybody called him Pop. So um, Brian called me up one day and I went over to his home in Bel Air and he was working on a song called Lady Love and it was not yet completed, not finished totally. And so I contributed a word here and an idea there and he was generous, generous enough to give me a, a writer's credit on it. Oops, I just smashed the microphone. So um, that's, that's the story of that, you know. And it's a nice song. It's got Brian written all over it, you know. Um, did you write with Carl at all? Never did. Never did. We tried. He invited me up to his home in um, Denver. He was actually living on Jim Gersio's property at Caribou Ranch at the time. This is um, early 80s. And so I had about six songs in my head that I brought up. Uh, and I played them all on guitar, even though some were written on keyboard. I don't think he had a piano or a keyboard in his place. So um, uh, I played one after another, after another, after another. And I'm saying to myself, oh boy, I'm not ringing his bells on any of these, you know. And um, finally, I played this one song. And he says, play that one again. It's called One More Night Alone. So, one more time, you know. In fact, that one I had written on keyboard, so I really had to struggle to translate it into the guitar chords. But then um, Jeff uh, Skunk Baxter was up there because he was chosen as Carl's producer for the project. And he uh, heard it and he said, that's the one. And then Jim Gersio came in and I played it for him and he said, that's the one. So that was the one. But we, we never collaborated. The idea of my trip up there was to write together, but it just never happened. Now there is a song that I did write called um, Let's Build a World that I like to credit Carl with helping me write it, even though he just changed one word, one, just one little word in it. It's about honesty and integrity and let's build a world where everyone wins is the lyric that I wrote. And the lyric that he suggested I changed, change was, um, yeah, I, I, I wrote, let's find a place that's cozy and warm where you feel safe from any harm. And, he, and, he, and I had played it for him. I think I sent him a demo of it. And I think I was on the phone with him and he said, why don't you change that to, let's make a place. Yeah, let's make a place that's cozy and warm, where you feel safe from any harm. And, you know, that really nailed it much better, much better than let's find a place, you know. Um, and so the few, very few times I've played that song in public, one was in the UK, I like to credit Carl with that song, even though it was just a word, and even though, you know, I don't know, some people might say, well, that's not writing a song, you know, he didn't write that song, or he didn't, you call that uh, contributing to a song? Well, People have gone to court over <laughs> a lot less than that, I think, you know, arguing over, you know, well, yes, I wrote that song, you know, um, the old saying, you know, write a third, <laughs> write a word, gain a third. <laughs> but uh, the point I'm saying is that the song, the spirit of the song, the idea of the song is so Carl, you know, that I like to include him in that, even though there, I don't have a piece of paper registered with, in Washington saying, written by Billy Hinch and Carl Wilson, you know. I like to acknowledge Carl for guiding me in that song. And right around that time you were touring with Carl, weren't you? Actually, the, 
around the time that I wrote th that song that I'm talking about, it was much later. Uh, One More Night Alone, yes, that era, yeah, that was the same, one in the same era, because he had already recorded one album and we had uh, toured behind it, and then One More Night Alone ended up on his second album. First album was Carl Wilson, and then second one was Youngblood, right? Yeah. yeah. So what was that experience like? What Touring? Yeah. It was hard. It was hard because it was like back to basics, you know. Uh, Carl flew, we drove um, from place to place. Of course, we flew to our first destination, but then we had a big van, and then that van got a little cozy, and we got a trailer. I mean, it was really, you know, I'd never done touring quite like that, you know, with Dino and Desi. We, did, we never traveled like that. But it was a matter of economics, and Carl was playing smaller places, and it wouldn't make sense to be really to be flying us around everywhere, but we eventually did um, on the second, third tour. Um, but it was intense, you know, we would load in our own gear, set it up, play the show, break it down, load it out, and drive to the next place sometimes. And it was, as I said, it was intense. You know, I was spoiled already by that time, you know, traveling with the Beach Boys, you know, private jets and fancy hotels and, you know, it was real, let's just get out there and hit the circuit and, you know, suck it up and just do it, you know, for Carl. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But it was hard work. I didn't know that he was writing a song for my dad, or much less recording a song for my dad. Um, they were very close, and Dennis would come over in the morning. I was still sleeping. I could hear them talking in the breakfast room next to my bedroom, and it was like, they just loved each other. They got a kick out of each other. They had a great time together. Dennis would take my dad, oh, places, you know, into Beverly Hills, and they'd just fool around and go into stores and cause trouble. And, you know, my dad got a big kick out of Dennis. And, you know, Dennis got a big kick out of my dad. And they just really had a special relationship. And um, uh, boy, when I first heard that song, I couldn't believe it. You know, it sounded real island to me like Hawaiian island, but some other kind of island that Dennis had somehow managed to create, you know, with the sounds that he used. And it really shook me up to hear that, you know. It really got to me. It still gets to me when I hear it, you know. and Because mm, I didn't hear it till after my dad had died, you know. My dad died in Dennis's arms. I don't know if you know that. Um, Dennis told me he was driving around Westwood, which is where my father was at UCLA Hospital. He says, I was driving around Westwood in, in my Porsche, and you know, all of a sudden my tooth fell out. And I thought, pop, you know. You know, Dennis was all, always so dramatic about, you know, especially talking about that. And so he says, I go over to the room, you know, and I was with him, and I, I had him in my arms, and he died, and you know. Because he, he called the house, because Dennis was the only person with my dad. It was late at night and you know everyone had left and you know my father was not conscious really he was sort of sleeping so to speak and uh, so uh, I can't think of a better person to be with Pop at that time than Dennis so uh, really that's another reason why I wrote the song for Dennis that I did so I uh, am happy that uh, I can you know continue Dennis's memory and, you know, keep it alive this way, you know, through the songs and through the films. And I had a friend who was very good to me. Now he's gone out on the rolling sea. Well, he took me places that I 
Well, it took me 